Hey everybody, we're just letting some folks in to the to the meeting. We're, we're going to get started shortly and try to be mindful of everyone's time. We'll start around 12.05. We see folks onboarding now. And, and for anyone that, that misses this or wants to share, uh, we'll have a recording available uh, shortly after this meeting, after we crop out the part where I couldn't figure out how to work Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, so, <laughs> so all of that, uh, yeah, let's give it a, a minute or so. Um, Okay. Um, let's see what's in the chat. Uh, okay. Cool. I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? No. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Great. Uh, also make everybody here a co-host. All right, so we've got a, a few folks. I think maybe in the in the next minute we should just get started and and try to keep things moving and then just offer up the let me just check my email first with random emails I'm getting. Yeah, we'll just make the recording available to, to everyone. Um, mark is not red. All right. All right, so Karina, you'll just see whoever else comes in or... All right, I'm going to get this off of my screen. All right, so we'll just get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the inaugural, I guess, that's the, the, the proper term, uh, Global Insurance Industry uh, DNI Roundtable. Uh, before we go into why we're here, and if everyone could mute. As you as you log in, um, before we get into why we're here, how all this came up came about, I want to introduce uh, Linda Reed, who's executive director of executive education at uh, the University of of Georgia's Terry College uh, of Business. Um, I won't over talk, Linda. You want? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, if you're on the East Coast now. And um, my name is Linda Reed, as uh, James has told you, and I am based in Atlanta, um, directing the executive education programs for Perry College of Business at University of Georgia. Uh, so I'm excited to welcome all of you to this insurance industry roundtable discussion on diversity and inclusion. And we're going to be featuring the topic of the ISO standard for diversity and inclusion. Uh, we plan to discuss how organizations are managing it as a risk and how you can learn to apply and assess an assessment and measure your progress. And um, this is important to us at Terry College. I think many of you know, um, we are the top ranked program in risk management and insurance, um, have been for years based on the rankings from US News and World Report. And we have over 175 full-time faculty a very strong department in risk management and insurance with our faculty who conduct research and um, share their expertise with our students and you know graduates are in demand. I imagine that there are some graduates here on this uh, roundtable call today as well. Um, but a lot of strength to leverage as part of programs such as our diversity and inclusion professional program, which we'll be discussing a little bit uh, in just a few minutes with James. Um, but also, you know, we do professional development programs here, leveraging the faculty talent on all types of topics 
and are very proud of our management ranking um, also and able to leverage that expertise um, and the research and put it to work for companies like yours. Uh, but over the past year and a half, we partnered with James Felton Keith and Inclusion Score, focusing on that niche between managing risk and insurance and yes, diversity and inclusion. And we developed a special certification program. And we've engaged with people all over the world and have enjoyed very much being able to um, share his expertise, his inclusion score methodology and help organizations such as yours. And so I know this was James's idea to pull everybody together and have this roundtable discussion. So um, back over to you, James, at this point to um, you know, lead the discussion and um, the upcoming agenda for this program. Thanks, Linda. Um, yeah, so everyone, before we, before we get into it, again, this is industry-wide, not just PNC folks, life folks, health folks, everyone's here. Uh, the reason we're at, at University of at Georgia, and Linda always does a good job of not uh, over bragging on on the Terry College of Business. That's that's my job. We're we're here because they are the number one ranked uh, institution for risk management and for insurance. And we just want to give some context of where we come from before we uh, do a deeper dive into. Uh, the round table and how we're envisioning it working and where we need all of you all's input going forward. So just to introduce myself, if, if you all aren't familiar with me, I know we invited uh, many of you. My name is James Felton Keith. I'm CEO at Inclusion Score. I also lead the lecturing on the ISO 30415 uh, certification uh, in diverse inclusion uh, at the Terry College. Uh, but, you know, our predecessor, or I guess everyone's predecessor is, is here, just to give us a, a few minutes of context of where we come from in, in diversity and inclusion. And then I'm gonna sort of fill everyone in on what we've been hearing across the industry, across many countries in South America, Africa, Europe, and North America, uh, and a few in Asia. Which one of them? Uh, just around where the industry is. And so I'd like to introduce briefly, uh, Dr. B.A., as we call her, or Dr. Dawn Bennett-Alexander. Um, I don't know how, how deeply she'll go into her background, but in, in my opinion, she's sort of the, the originator of, of this space, giving one of the first, if not the first, diversity talk or talk with that title at UGA. Um, she's a, a professor emeritus uh, of employment law and wrote the first employment law book, which you can see on your screen here uh down at, at UGA and so with that said um Dr. B.A. thanks for thanks for taking the time out of, out of your day and joining us if if you could just give us a bit of context of where we are in 2023 and where we've where we've come from over the course of the past half century and in, in doing this work we yeah we'd love to hear your thoughts yeah. thank you so much James for inviting me and thank you to all of you who are either here on the call itself or uh, we'll see this later. This is an extremely important piece for me. Uh, I love what the evolution has been. And I have to tell you that the evolution uh, really can be thought of as an evolution because this has not been a, um, a short process. Uh, in, in matter, as a matter of fact, 60 years ago this year, on August 28th, as a 12-year-old, I was at the March on Washington where Dr. Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech, and the next year, the 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed. And it never occurred to me that hot, sweaty August day that 60 years later, I would have written the first employment law textbook uh, that is now in its going into its 11th edition that I would have, after retiring, started a fictional series of cozy mysteries about diversity. Never heard of that before, just like there had never been an employment law textbook before. Um, having won the MLK award, uh, the highest award for diversity at the U University of Georgia, or upon my retirement 
having them at, after 60 awards and for all sorts of things, teaching, service, uh, having the university create the Dawn D. Bennett Alexander Inclusive Community Award that is a moneyed award for faculty who deal with diversity both inside and outside the classroom never occurred to me. It also probably never occurred to me as a 12 year old that at 72, I would be here begging you to deal with what I have used for my life's work. I cannot tell you how excited I am about the international standard for diversity that was passed two years ago, uh, this coming May. It has been a long time coming. I was on that committee, uh, that task force for the first three years, uh, seven years later. So this was 10 years in the making. They eventually got 152, I think it is now, James, signatories around the world to the international standard for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And it all sort of stemmed out of what it was that I was asked to come up with. Uh, and I think it's important for you to understand that this was not something that was already cast in stone. I was a practicing attorney when um, the head of the agency I was working for asked me if I would go to Florida to teach for the person he used to work for as the head of the Public Employee Relations Commission in New York to develop a course based on something that that now retired executive director had seen. And that was that when unfair labor practices came up, I was a labor lawyer, um, when they came up, there were two kinds of things constantly got ignored. And he did not know what to do about that. So when he retired and went to Florida, um, he asked if maybe there could be a course developed on it. And he reached out to his old friend who was now at the National, uh, 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 the Federal Labor Relations Authority to see if anybody in that, the, the lawyers that were there would be interested in coming to develop a class and teach it. That class ended up being employment law because what he kept seeing was that race and gender claims, if, if the unfair labor practice involved those, which many of them did, they were completely ignored. Nobody knew what to do with that. And he didn't know what to do with it either, didn't know, and this was probably in the 70s, didn't know how to handle it. So in 1982, I developed the first class in employment law and 12 years later, ended up writing the first textbook in employment law. And as a part of that teaching, I started doing consulting work on the issue of employment law because all of these people were doing were, were in the context of needing to know about it and were clueless about it. There was this thing called the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act that prohibited employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, gender, or sex. And people were operating every day, even into the 80s without realizing what it was, even though it had been passed in 1964. So you can imagine um, what that, how, how, deeply I feel about not only coming up with that class that taught the world because there then became classes all over the place for it, uh, literally all over the world, uh, as well as the textbook going all over the world. Uh, so coming up with later the diversity standard that ended up being for the world, you can imagine how much that meant to me. For 40 years, I have been saying it, it is cheaper to have me come in and do consulting for you, train your employees on how to avoid liability than it is to pay out both the litigation cost as well as the potential liability for these kinds of avoidable claims. To find that the insurance industry finally caught up with that message, looked at their numbers and said, this is crazy. We're losing too much money on these claims. Something can be done about it. And then pushing for the international standard ends up being the realization of a dream I didn't even think I, I could form in my head because it was just too incredible to ever be true. Mm -hmm. A worldwide standard on this. So 
a lot of what it is that I love about what James is going to talk to you about is that everybody's not familiar with this territory. And for him to have come up with inclusion score creating software to walk you through this process, understanding it is going to be new for a lot of people is more tremendous than I can ever say. It's so important. We need all the resources that corporations have going toward what they think is important. They don't think paying out unnecessary claims is important. This is a way to help not have that happen. So with that, I'll pass it back over to James, but that gives you a little bit of context as to how important it is that you're here why you're here and how this can help no matter what discipline that you're dealing with. It's not just for the insurance industry. Anywhere you've got people working, you need to hear what it is that James is going to tell you. Thanks so Thank much. You, James. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I know you've you got to drop off in a in a bit. So if anyone has questions uh, specifically for uh, Dr. Bian and her work, um, definitely put them in the chat. We'll, we'll get them to her. Um, so, so building on that work and the, the real reason we're here, and we'll talk more about the industry and some of the things going on. Um, I've spent the majority of my life as a process engineer and turning in methodologies into corporate change management, which is really how we make change. And so really over the course of the past two years, since the summer of 2020, that chaotic summer, or seemingly, I should say, chaotic summer of 2020 during the COVID crisis, not only here in the United States, but also in the UK, in Spain, in France, in South Africa, uh, in Denmark, in Australia, there were uprisings of all sorts around all sorts of different participants in society. And as I traveled around, doing a lot of conferencing, I just happening to be an insurance industry professional. I've, a lot of my work is rooted not just in technology development, but underwriting, really underwriting the sort of risk instruments that exist around diversity and inclusion. We'll talk more about those. Uh, is I heard the same thing, whether I was in California or Copenhagen, and I know one's a city and one's a state, but wherever I was, uh, I would hear regularly that, that we didn't have any central locations that everyone from across the industry could participate to find out what best practices are, uh, where they fit. And so, you know, I go to a lot of conferences, not only about the industry, right? Whether we're talking about property and casualty insurance or life insurance or health and disability insurance, but also where we're talking about the functions of inclusivity, whether it be specific to products, product delivery, supplier diversity, uh, like UGA, for instance, has a huge supplier diversity council in, in that region. And I know, you know, others at other universities uh, or whether we're talking about human resources, right? And so the graphic that you see here on the screen, what it does is segment the industry or the insurance industry, because what we found, you know, I was at the, the national you know, African American Insurance Association here in the United States uh, annual meeting in Baltimore a few months ago. And I was in a room of about 70 people and they were all asking what groups they could join to figure out how to deliver DNI better, not only inside their companies, but also to their clients, whatever sort of clients they had. And a lot of the feedback that was given were finance groups, whether they be supplier diversity and finance, HR and finance, or just financial industry umbrella groups. And if you're, you know, if you spent time in the industry, the insurance industry, that is, you know, just per regulation and per how we function, we're a lot different than finance, uh, even though you could argue that we're under the finance umbrella. I would actually argue the opposite, that finance is under the insurance umbrella, because without risk capital, there's no capital markets, financial markets, uh, you name it. But where we where we left is we started talking with some professionals in our network from companies like State Farm and Chubb and Lloyd's of London and 
and just many other firms about building a series of round tables under the broader umbrella of the insurance industry right here at UGA so that we can start to discuss best practices, no matter what your job function is or what your industry silo is. And so really what we're here to do today is to build the initial advisory board of folks to show up on behalf of their companies. What we're really asking of, of this group is to go back to whoever you need to, uh, you know, in your legal department, HR department, et cetera, and get, and we'll follow up with an email after this. But basically we're asking for everyone to get uh, the green light to join one of these advisory boards so that we can start bringing the industry knowledge that everyone has into these different silos that you see here in these nine boxes. So again, I don't know if I can zoom here because I'm sharing, but if you can't see these tiny words on the screen, we break out the industry into three subcategories. So you've got P and C folks, you've got life insurance folks, we've got health and disability folks. And then from a business model standpoint, we've differentiated the reinsurers from the carriers, from the brokers, depending on where you work. And DNI, diversity and inclusion, that is, will look slightly different depending on what your company does. And last but not least, we've broken out job functions. So the majority of people that we see participating around diversity and inclusion are either HR people, those are one type of professional, supplier diversity people, usually procurement people, a different type of professional. And last but not least, our product delivery people. And whether your product is a service or something more tangible, you fit into this equation and trying to figure out how our products at whatever our companies are engage the broader society that we plan to you know, bring those products and services to market for. And so that's really our objective here is to solve that problem of every time we're at conferences, folks are unsure about where to show up and participate specific to the industry to find out more on best practices. So with that said, I just want to give a little bit more context, especially to some of the things that Dr. B.A. brought up. So she's a lawyer, right? And lawyers and legal risk are primarily what's driving the conversation for standardization with regards to diversity and inclusion across the board. These are some old stats, old graphics out of Gallagher, Willis Towers Watson, two large brokerages, if you're not familiar, really documenting the rise in claims and things like employment practices, liability, but also complaints per week. And these are not American numbers. These are European numbers, but the numbers look much more dangerous and interesting over here on, on our side of the pond. Um, if you're wondering what type of insurance is sort of incentivizing not only changes in our own industry, but every other industry. It's really these three to six policy types that are on the left-hand side of the screen. So policy types like employment practices liability, right? That insurance is, we usually see happening, it's HR issues trigger that, but also directors and officers. Um, directors and officers insurance is, you know, usually insurance insuring the, the risk that, you know, high level management staff take on at, at any firm. Errors and emissions are also in play. If you think about, for instance, I, I know a firm in the UK that just crossed the internet looking for websites in the US that, uh, that failed to meet the Americans with Disability Act standards. And they tried to incentivize them to buy more errors and emissions insurance. Management liability is sort of a general group that encompasses some of these, the other three, fiduciary responsibilities, worker compensation, is also uh, at play when we think about insurance risk. And whether you're on the PNC insurance side or life or health, uh, this affects your company. If it doesn't affect your clients, it at least affects the companies that you all work for. And so again, a lot of this stuff comes on the heels of Dr. BA's early work, let's say 40 years ago, has really hit a fever pitch where now in 2023, 2022, 2021, we see claims uh, happening at a, at a really high level. We see about $10 billion in claims globally. So a lot of these claims are bigger than 
for in the United States, for instance, what you would see at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Those are people who know to engage a government body about what's going on with them. But a lot of people don't know that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission even exists. Still, when companies make settlements, they do that if the CFO is smart with an insurance claim. It's just less expensive. And so regulation is also starting to run down where we see um, regs coming from, okay, I see you, Corinna. Uh, regs coming from states like New York that are starting to identify uh, a lack of auditable diversity and inclusion policy as a systemic risk. Last but not least, again, we talk about the broader market. The big thing that's driving a lot of this change are the fact that the largest companies that we all know about, the S&P 500, about pr pretty much all of them claim that about 90% of their balance sheets are intangible assets. And they typically take out policy on those assets. And if you're not familiar with intangible assets, that's just code for people, right? At the same time, those people are raising grievances at an increasingly higher rate. And so what we use here at UGA is the international standard, the ISO 30415 standard built out by the International Organization of Standards, not us. It's across 163 countries. More than 2,000 consultants and policymakers came together in Geneva to ratify this. Um, but the, the real deal is we're looking to implement this standardization in order to try to incentivize more risk management and less risk transfer, if you will. And risk transfer is just code for insurance policies. So with that said, uh, we had only plan for a 30 minute meeting, even though we, you know, we can't afford, at least I can afford to run on a bit. I want to open up for questions that any of you all might have from your companies, from your experience, from your expect uh, perspective, excuse me, um, as we try to figure out how we can come together um, here on this global DNI round table. So are there are there any questions specific to the information that we've just shared, specific to the round table, specific to what participation looks like? I can get into some of those details that we put uh, on our website, but are there just any questions in general? I know a lot of you are on, probably on mute, but. Okay. While we're waiting for questions, if there are any questions, um, I'd like to- yeah. Oh, it's a different, it's a... yeah, uh, this is, yeah, this yeah. is Chris Dunn um, wanna... with New York Life. I mean, I'm very curious to see, uh, to know if other people yeah. find um, the challenges that I have found in the LGBT yeah. community. Um, you know, I have, uh, yeah. I've been doing this now, I'm, I'm in my fourth yeah. year, um, and I've kind of had to to shift a little bit. I tried to make the LGBT community uh, my target uh, audience and, and market. Yeah, uh, and, and internally trying to explain to them the reasons uh, were, were externally. Uh, it was very difficult. Okay. Uh, and I'm just curious to know if other people have, have uh, encountered the same kind of sort of uh, all set wall and right. and I have my own uh, assumptions as to why that is, and some of them are from experience, and some of them are just suppositions. Uh, but the primary one is that uh, we, as a community, uh, like to be—I I boil it down to—we like to be fabulous. Sure. Uh, we, we like to uh, we like to look good and and show everybody everything that we have. But we didn't have the knowledge and training from yeah. individuals to learn how to save and how to plan. And it's, you know, at 45 or 50 to say, well, I only have $125,000 saved in my retirement account is somewhat personal and embarrassing. So, uh, you know, to actually have that conversation, um, sure. you know. Yeah, well, I have um, any so, well, first, thank you, Chris, for the question. I think, Again, that's uh, so for everyone else, if you're in a different part of the industry, I think that's a, a life insurance specific question and specific to uh, a 
particular group, I would say this is a, exactly the reason that we need a round table por portion specific to life and specific to that group so that not only New York Life, but Prudential and say other you know life insurance firms can get together and, and think about what, if anything, yeah. from a product standpoint, it is hard. communicate into a particular community to that figure out how to bring them in and, and educate them hard. about <laughs> why they might need this particular type of insurance. And well, so, I, I, I'm sorry. I just want to, I also want to say I'm, I'm generalizing uh, financial services. It's, it's all finance for retirement. It's not just life sure. insurance. Sure. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. You, yeah. So, so financial services, yeah. retirement, uh, insurance in general, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think we're missing a slide that I should have added which segments, again, per the standard, the reason we're using this graphic that you see on your screen, it not only segments functional types of companies, but it also segments diversity types. So in this standard, to break it down for everyone, and maybe I'll, I'll stop sharing and pull up another screen and then reshare. So the way we're segmenting every industry and every interaction is via these 32 domains of DNI per the standard, but also 27 diversity types, LGBT is one of them, things like parenting, neurodiversity, ethnicity, gender, age, you name it, are all different diversity types. And that 27 number does not mean at all that if we interviewed 8 billion people on the planet, there wouldn't be 8 billion types of diversity. But these 27 types are the types that show up in legal dockets and HR. And if you're, if you're in a B2C or business to consumer sort of role, like if you're in the life and financial services space, then it even breaks out from a product standpoint, how we should be communicating to those folks. And so I think, Chris, that was a great question. What, what we need to do as an industry is fill out more voices that may have, you know, well-baked and even some half-baked answers to your question so that we can start to uh, understand how we might proceed as a group instead of trying to execute things in in silos. But I think that was a that was a great question, especially in the life and financial services space. Mm -hmm. I see another hand up from. Uh, am I pronouncing this correct? Sh Shireen. Shireen. Yes, that, that was that was a good go. Yes. Sure. Hi. Thank you. Uh, this is Shereem Satterfield. Um, yes. And uh, I first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. Extremely helpful uh, in regards to the earlier comment. I know one of the things uh, that we do here at our organization is try to work with our ERG groups. Um, and that's something, you know, I know all, each insurance agency is different in how they're set up. But uh, working with your ERG groups to, quite frankly, get that information about, you know, working with them to identify what's happening in their community, um, get that idea of what we can do as an organization so that we can look at our products, so that we can look at our uh, processes and determine, hey, what are some things that we may be missing out on and really getting that insight. So in terms of what are some things that I think we can do as insurance companies is to make sure that we tap into our inner, our, our inner employee groups tap into those individuals that can provide us with that insight. We've got a pride ERG. We've got ERGs for these other you know, communities within uh, the company. And I think if we start really working with them to assist the executives in understanding what the needs of the community might be, uh, I think that's a great first start. So just in, in response to that question, what are some ways that we can work together to, to get information out, to learn more, to help our different aspects of community, I think that's definitely a way to do it. So I just want to throw that out there. No, I love that. I think, yeah, and, and, and if folks aren't familiar with ERGs or it stands for employee resource groups. And, you know, I was advising a, a large, well, I'm mentioning by name right now, some of them might be on, on the line. Uh, maybe they want to chime in if, if they are, but a large carrier uh, in Massachusetts around, they were asking, uh, a lot of their supply chain partners, like companies that feed them products and services about how they engage diverse communities across the board. And they were asking them some very explicit questions, them being they were asking their suppliers about their employers and their suppliers' clients, very specific questions about this 27 number, these 27 types of diversity. And 
my response to them, and this is something that we teach in the certification program that we have uh, down at the Terry College, is we really dig into, there's a portion of the standard called onboarding and induction. And if you already have a place for people to coalesce, no matter if you're a large hospital or if you're a financial services and life insurance company, or if you're a big PNC carrier or broker, uh, if you build a place for everyone to exist and you fit them in those places as you onboard them in categories like these, then you don't have to necessarily you know, bombard folks with questions that they may or may not want to answer based on your early interaction with them. So a lot of the world going forward to build on the work that was done 60, 40, and 20 years ago from folks like Dr. B.A. is, is turned into work of policy design and technical writing, right? Now it's about, do we have documentation about where folks should be so that we can bring more product-centric people focused on how we engage whoever that community is to figure out how to best interact with them. And the best way to ask them how we interact with them is to, is to engage them directly, right? And so one of the big objectives, again, of this round table is really be a round table of round tables. We know that some folks will fit in the silos that others don't, but if we're having uh, fruitful conversations across these nine categories and then are able to bring them back to the umbrella org to understand what needs to change cross-functionally, then I think we'll be in a, in a better place. And what I've seen and how we can get or often are gobbled up by the finance folks is we lose a lot of the industry-specific interaction that we're trying to have. Again, whether we are on the PNC or life and financial services or the health and disability side, and again, the way we engage the people that we interact with in all those three business silos can be very different. It can not only be very different here in the United States, but also very different in with our counterparts in Europe, especially if we're multinational firms. For instance, you know, we do a lot of work in, in Germany and France and per the, the European Union and those being the two largest companies, countries, excuse me, in the European Union, they are not allowed to legally collect race and ethnic data because of how they see targeting. You get other countries that do that same thing around LGBT and, and, and uh, other minority categories like neurodiversity, which is coming on big. And so how we build internal corporate infrastructure to engage folks that are more marginalized that may need more resources than others or just different resources than others, it will come down to how we project manage that inside of our institutions. It's not necessarily a proxy of marketing or just being better communicators. Sometimes we have to design a path to have that conversation uh, in the first place. And so, um, so yeah, so, so great question. And, and thank you, uh, Shireen, for even, for, for jumping, jumping on that. I do think everyone should have a bunch of ERGs in their firm, even if they can't fill them up on day one, they should still be engaged. Um, are there any more general questions? Uh, I can't see. Do you all see this on my screen? You know, I, I have one. If, uh, if you mind. Oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Carlos. Um, the website you're showing, uh, I tried to do like a profile and it says like a, a code is needed. Is there a way to follow that website or is there like, do they have like a newsletter or something that, or distribution list that, we can get, uh, join to get updated whenever there's information added to this website. Well, uh, what what website? The one that you're just showing. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, I don't know who's showing it. Yeah, yeah, I was showing it. Um, so yeah, so we we have you all's email. We'll we'll follow up with you with you after this about. So yeah, you you can. I'll send you a link where you can join the the website. But also, what we what we really hope is that everyone here will. Join the broader round table, pick your silo. Like these are your, these nine boxes are your, your industry level ERGs, if you will, to use Shareem's earlier reference. We, we'd love for everyone to pick the box that they fit in and we'll start building around you in that, that particular category. Uh, but yeah, we can, we can totally keep you on an email list with, 
you know, what's happening uh, as we grow later. I see another hand up from Camille. Oh, this is a name I know. Hey, Camille. Uh, hi, James. How are you? Hello, everyone. James, so I have a quick question um, just related to more of an internal issue, but I know I'm pretty certain you can help with this matter. What approach is best to take to help? Like we know we're supposed to engage with diverse suppliers. We know what we need to do, but what approach can you take to get the BUs more involved? And just to give some background, I work in procurement and that's the issue, right? Like I can't tell the business units how to spend their money. What I can right. do is encourage them to kind of break away from the usual suspects that they tend to use. But what approach do you have that can kind of help overcome that aspect of it? So what we've seen, so that's a great question. And for everyone who's just hearing come out, if you can see the screen, again, per these nine categories on the screen, we'd love for some of you to, some of you may check off multiple boxes. So she would be, I just happen to know what firm she's at. So she'd be in the property and casualty space, plus also the, the supplier diversity space, right? So we, we'd love to have our insight or really a question like this for everyone in both of those buckets because there may be many people thinking about this same question who maybe they can't get great insight from their counterparts in the finance industry or in the, I don't know, telecom industry, or whatever diversity groups they join, right? They're not industry specific. But anyway, to your question, Camilla, we deal with a lot of procurement and supplier diversity folks in the UGA program here. Uh, the, the best incentive to interact with the business units or the BUs is a policy that comes from procurement or supplier diversity. And it, the policy is meant to be delivered to the BU's management. And so again, for everyone else, BU just stands for business unit. This policy level should really be specific to business unit managers uh, reporting capability. So they should be able to report on DNI and how they're engaging it, just like they would accounting, just like they would engineering, processes like Lean Six Sigma, just like they would cybersecurity protocols and who's breaching what. And the way you, you incentivize them to be accountable is you have this third party interacting to what Shireen mentioned earlier. You have ERGs. ERGs do not do and should not do diverse inclusion work. They're advisory boards. They're essentially your bully pulpits to say if procurement is pushing a policy onto the business unit manager for a particular product type, right? And those are product people, which is also a category in these nine spaces. But let's say they're not using it or the policy is half-baked, which it may be on day one, which is fine. The ERGs may say, you know, for our community, for the women at this firm or the women that would like to see more women suppliers or the, the neurodiverse folks or the di disability folks, we want to see these product people engage a group like Disability In, which if you're not familiar, is the Global Trade Association or Chamber of Commerce for Disabled Entrepreneurs, right? And so that policy structure could start out as a one-page or two-pager, but you're using it to track change management across those business units. And it's driven by procurement or supplier diversity who just want to see more demand from the business unit and the way, again, you hold the business units accountable is via ERGs, because if you have 27 of them or if you have two of them, let's be honest, in a lot of places, folks are going to have two. They're going to have a women's ones first, and then they'll either do, it may be some form of brown person. It may be a black group, a Latino group, you know, Latin A, Latinx group. It could be an LGBT group, you name it. But as they have those, those groups their real role should be being responsible to add notes to that policy to say, this is what we would like the business unit folks to think about. And here's some recommendations on where to find suppliers if you can. So that's a procurement scenario, right? We, we do something different for HR, but the way you incentivize change in any business unit, whether specific to product, procurement, or HR, is you do it through a policy document and you leverage those ERGs to hold the organization accountable. Okay. Um, James, if, if, if I could just add um, yeah. those policy statements 
it is extremely important to have that come from the top down. That's where everybody takes their marching orders from. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, it's going to be hard to get those managers to get what they need to be able to pass it on. Let's be real. Everybody reacts to what it is that their incentive is. If from the top down, the word is, y'all got to do better with diversity. I don't care where you are in this organization. You have got to deal with diversity. If you're in supplier, fine. If you're in HR, fine. If you're in human, re whatever. If you don't have that top down message that you can always refer back to. And, and, and for me, it's almost, I, I tend to be really practical. You say to your employees, this isn't me talking. This is what the head of this organization wants, okay? And they have made it real clear that all of us have to do our part for this. We happen to be procurement. Mm -hmm. So for procurement, we have to figure out how to do that. Then what you end up with is those management strategies that go down to the folks who are actually doing it and basing it on being able to really give people resources to do what they need to. So we're not just talking about throwing this out and dealing with it as just some theoretical issue. No, it's going to take some time, effort, and energy to go out and find these people who can be people who we have traditionally not included in that procurement process and go from there, okay? Then give me what I need. Don't tell me I need to do this and then not give me what I need to be able to do this. This is not rocket science stuff. If 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 that's why somebody like the head of an organization is so incredibly important, because if it's important for them and the people who report to them know it's important for them because their paycheck belongs, I mean, is, is dependent on that, oh, they'll, that message will get out. Thank you, both of you. Mm -hmm. Oh, James, you're muted. Right, sorry. Um, so we're gonna answer one more question. I see a, a hand up from, from Paul Young and then just to be mindful of everyone's time, we're gonna wrap this up. We will make this video available. If, if you don't know if we have your email, just send it to us. But we're gonna email the broader list of the 200 or so folks that, that RSVP'd and get this video back out and keep the conversation going and try to, again, put folks in their box. We we did see the note about excess and surplus lines. I think that fits in into these categories, but we, we can discuss that. So let's just go into this, this last question from, is it Paul? Yes. Hey, hello, everybody. James, it's good to see you, man. Um, so my question is a little nuanced, and I think everybody's questions would be nuanced. So just real quick, just a little background. Um, I'm definitely what you would, I'm on the property and casualty side, uh, and also kind of on the personal line side, but I don't touch any of that anymore. Um, my background is ENS, all of that, uh, and found my way into a mergers and acquisitions role. And where this is interesting is, you know, I'm going head to head with some pretty nice sized organizations. And when I say nice size, think of like Arthur J. Gallagher, Locked In, Hub, uh, and trying to acquire agencies. And the biggest, uh, the first thing that I noticed in this role is, I'm, and I'm primarily focused on the Southeast, you know, we have a, a certain revenue band that we have to hit. And if it's not within that revenue band, definitely it can't be below. It creates a problem for me. And what I've realized is every phone call that I've made, every person that I've reached out to has, for the most part, been a cisgender, you know, uh, middle-aged white man. And essentially, I'm in a position where I can cut these people a check, you know, that turn, takes them from being paper millionaires into true real life millionaires overnight, essentially, right? So naturally I thought, well, I need to start finding people of all different types of backgrounds to make this happen because, you know, rising tide lifts all ships. And what I'm discovering is most successful or what we would call successful agency owners fit into that demographic that I just named. And so I guess the question that I have and probably something that we need to noodle on is, you know, I'm a member of NIA. I know that there are independent agents in NIA, all of that, but what can we do Right. There's two parts to this. Number one, we've got to get people to see that when you sell your agency, you're not selling your livelihood, you're liquidating your livelihood and you're able to do whatever you want to with that money. Right. But then number two, what resources are available to agency owners who are minorities that are trying to grow their business, but are now up against, you know, basically 
a, a, a group of agencies that come together and share their resources, right, for carriers, for all these different things, and they get even more checks, right, and, and they're growing the value of their agency even more, and they're locking people out. I can't tell you, in the I've only been in this role for 90 days as of yesterday, and I can't tell you how many times I've been in the room and been the only Black face in the room, right, and been, and, and been in the room and seen only like maybe three women, and that's a problem because Marsh, AIG, Aon, these me mega organizations, they're going to hit their, you know, their metrics, right? They're going to hire for the DE&I piece. But for these smaller agencies where there's a lot of wealth to be had, people are being left out. And I guess the question that I'm asking after saying all that is, what can we do about this? How can we get resources to people who are growing their own agencies? And how can we find those who are within that revenue band that I need so I can at least have a conversation with them and let them know what's available? So number one, I think that's a, a great question. And now I can see you on, is that Paul? Yeah, I know you're not used to be having hair and a beard. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, you, right. You, you used to be a kid. Not anyway. Um, <laughs> all right, so now we'll get to that in the, in a second. Um, so the first thing I would think about is a, a woman named Whitney Dillard who was on our sort of inaugural. You know Whitney mm -hmm. at the Big Guy, and what's her and folks like Benny Jones out of Chicago is doing. He used to be chair of the diversity board at the at the Big Guy. I will say this. In a lot of these places, infrastructure needs to be built. You know, insurance is, in my opinion, the oldest industry on the planet. I know people make crash jokes about what the oldest industry is, but it's, it's actually insurance. And it, building out this round table doesn't mean, you know, that tomorrow we're going to radically change the face of, of who's in insurance or why it's even attractive. Most people grow up hating insurance because we got to get that first no fault policy on the raggedy car that's about 20 years old that we have when we're 16. So no one really loves insurance. But I do think that, again, if we bring in these sort of nuanced questions that you and everyone else really ask, if everyone noticed, everyone asks a very nuanced question that's industry or functional specific to them. And that's great. But this is why we need these intimate roundtables to ask these questions and scale out of it. What I would say, though, Paul, is we can systematically plan out how we build infrastructure, right? To incentivize not only, you know, more black folks, but more just minorities, people of color, disabled folks, you name it, women, to build out these agencies and participate. And we can also build into the regulatory body via the 55 insurance commissioners in this country, what uh, too much cooperation looks like in different regions, because Insurance is very different from finance because it is so heavily regulated intentionally to increase competition. So I think that our big work is to wave the flag around what we see as possibly too much cooperation. And while the marshes of the world have, you know, the S&P 500, I think I, if I were you, I'd be more worried about, like, for instance, what, what AccraSure and, and IOA are doing and, and rounding up folks. But the point there is there needs to be an organized effort to look at what competition looks like region by region, because in some regions, that sort of activity may be necessary. I think in other regions, especially when you see uh, more complexity via urban areas, it may not be necessary. I mean, there's an economic debate to be had, but we have to have it in an insurance-specific, PNC-specific, brokering specific space around how we do product delivery, which again, are how we are categorizing and segmenting the, the industries per, per the nine categories over there. And so what we hope is that, you know, you and, and your firm will, will participate so that as we think up uh, solutions to problems that we can distribute those well, because again, this is the kind of question, the question you just asked is the kind of question we never hear at a conference because there's never enough time in a 30 minute or one hour panel to do a deep dive in the real problems that we see. So this is this is really a reaction to getting questions at conferences where you're like, we, we don't have any time to answer this. I got to run to the next lunch <laughs> or dinner or you name it. Um, I'm a sucker for questions. So just, I guess one last one for, I see Jeffrey's hand up, so. Actually, I had a comment. To, okay. to the question that was raised. I actually head up distribution for Chubb International. So, you know, we do business in 54 countries. I have responsibility for business in 12 of them. And so 
So the question regarding agency, really succession planning, perpetuation planning, I agree with, with, with the last respondent in terms of the fact that there are our, our lack of dedicated resources from the company perspective to help our, indep our independent partners around that body of work. Um, one of the things that I've done internally is I have actually hired consulting like resources internally so that they can talk about the agency holistically. So we don't just focus specifically on our share of wallet within the agency space, but begin to talk more so about their plans on a go forward basis, their positioning around being future ready, or whether or not they have a perpetuation or succession plan in place. And then if not, we try to at least utilize our, our scope and view of all of the agencies that are there and those that may be looking to purchase to the points that you've raised there. If there, there, there are some that just don't know that you can get, I mean, if you're looking at the EBITDA model or some of the multiples that are being extended to agencies that lack perpetuation, but have a sound book of business that's worth buying so that it can produce a return to someone who wants to expand their reach or perhaps their niches in their respective businesses. And if it, in having workshops, I think that are dedicated to those forums are, are important. The other thing is that I would encourage agencies, uh, particularly minority owned agencies, first generation owned agencies to get involved, not only with NIA, but the multicultural agents forum, like with the, with the big eye. So that way yeah. you're in the majority conversations to know some of the deals that are being made and some of the resources that are available. And we've got to tap into them, right? So we've got to take a, a degree of initiative and, and ownership of inserting ourselves in those spaces, although we may be the only one in the room. So it's just something that, I, that, that it's very, I'm very passionate about because even in my former role at Travelers, I have response for emerging, uh, responsibilities for emerging and diverse markets. And it was always a topic of discussion with getting our agents, our people to be able to take advantage of those type of resources um, so that they can grow their organizations or take advantage of some buyouts that are on the table. So just wanted to add that comment. No, I love that. I think that sort of interaction is exactly what we would want to see in those roundtables where folks are talking about. And I think you all are too, interestingly, but yet different ends ends of the coin and, and how you're engaging the problem. I will say, I, I hate to wrap up so uh, soon because we haven't heard from any healthcare folks. I know that there's some healthcare folks in there. Uh, in here right now, but we'll we'll make this video public. Um, we'll reach back out to everyone. We we do hope that you, in particular, on behalf of your firms, will be able to join the roundtable so that we can start to silo some of these very detailed conversations about how we build more infrastructure to scale inclusivity uh, again across the board, um, across these nine category types across the 32 domains of the ISO standard, across those 27 types of individual that participate in, are participated in this market. Um, so with that said, I'll just say thank you. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll follow up soon. Any, anything else, Carmen, I, I see your face. No. I wouldn't mind going down a couple of slides to do a quick mention on the certificate program that's coming up. Sure. So again, a lot of these questions specific to, to UGA, you're right, Carmen, I forgot that piece. Um, what we're doing down at UGA, the certification program that we have in the standard, I think answers a lot of internal operational questions for any type of organization, especially any organization with more than 50 people. And between myself, Don Ben Alexander, who you met today, and Ephraim Henderson, who was the lead convener of the standard in Geneva, but he's actually a, a Seattle person for anyone on the West Coast. Um, we lead this program and uh, a, lot of, a lot of firms, a lot of carriers, a lot of agents uh, have been through this program and leverage it to streamline their communication of DNI to whoever their, their client body are. I think if you scan this barcode, uh, it'll take you right to more information about the program. Uh, we're also on, on LinkedIn. I think I'm going to follow up with an email after this to show everyone how and where we convene uh, not only the, the UGA executive education page, but we have a, a private group of DNI professionals who talk about this. And again, as some of you all's firms are looking for consulting types, whether it's to talk to 
your firm or your client's firm or partner firms that you're interacting with, we have hundreds of folks that are available uh, across 25 countries to do a deep dive into, into a lot of this. And so uh, with that said, uh, do follow us, uh, do send us an email. We'll, we'll loop you in with everyone and be sure to, to keep you all up to date uh, as we communicate more on, on this round table coming together. We plan to meet quarterly on this uh, and post this meeting. We'll put out a, a communication that establishes who is in what silo and, and how they need uh, more friends and, and, and even foes <laughs> to, to join them as they, as they scale up. So thanks again. And also this is my email. Uh, it's, my inbox is a bit crazy, but feel free to shoot me an email. Just uh, JFK at inclusionscore.io. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. We're everywhere for the most part. Um, I'll put it in the chat. With that said, I think that's it for, for me, unless anyone has anything else. And I'm just typing, probably maybe a typo in my email. Let's see, nope, okay. All right, folks, thank you for your time.